any point if you want to ask a question um you know the usuals so um this week we are doing abstract art and actually i got some really good um comments and um questions from people in preparation for the class and some of the images that you were sending me all of you um were from the early 20th century um things like mondrian and picasso and things like this which made me realize that we can't or we shouldn't just jump straight into 1950s american ab abstract expressionism abstract art jackson pollock stuff which was the link that i sent you all for the reading this interesting article about jackson pollock i realized that in order to do this properly we need to go back to the early 20th century um and i'm so glad i did because honestly it's a, it's when we do get to jackson pollock it will be so much better for having just covered all of this stuff and it's actually great because i think lots of this will be familiar to some of you who enjoy art um but it's it's one of these art movements abstract art that you feel like you're familiar with but actually it's got lots of um historical bits that people often overlook like abstract art is not just art for the sake of art or just beautiful so anyway I'm blabbering on hopefully it will be interesting so in order to understand if we're really going to go back to the beginning we're actually going to go like to the beginning and understand realism in order to understand its complete opposite which is abstract art um realism is a movement in art that happened around the 1850s um in France primarily. Um, and these two paintings that you can see on the screen are two really famous, really iconic realist works. And they look really boring, honestly. They look really boring at first <laughs> glance and not very good, but they were actually totally uh, radical for their time. And that's because this was their time. This was like the classic, you know trendy fashionable way of painting at the time uh, and you can see just <laughs> how different it is um, really it has no comparison this cabanal birth of venus is what is often used to describe like the epitome of traditional academic painting this was produced in the French Academy of Art in Paris in 1863, which basically hadn't changed its style of painting really for centuries. Like when we did the class in the Renaissance, I mentioned to all of you that from the Renaissance onwards, art academies started to be established. For example, you had the first art academy ever established in, Fro in Florence, then you had the French Academy of Art, the Royal British Academy of Art, which is still standing in London. Uh, the Royal Academy, uh, another academy in Vienna, academies here, there and everywhere. Um, and um, yeah, academies everywhere, basically. And the French Academy in particular was very traditional, i.e. they still followed the way of painting that had been established in the, uh, in the Renaissance, like mirroring and copying and doing drawings of Greek classical statues, which is why even into the 19th century, 1863, you still get neoclassical paintings that are about mythological subject masses, etc., etc. Anyway, clearly this was very outdated. And not only was it outdated, but some artists started to think it was actually politically politically just um, immoral almost. Uh, and that's why they turned towards subjects that were actually real, to do with real life. Painting peasants, painting people who weren't rich, people who weren't fictional, um, actually using art to, for the first time ever, really bring real life people into the academies of art. Never been done before. Um, really, really radical and actually in line with things like the publication of Marx's Communist Manifesto, which had happened in 1848, 
sometime in the 1840s, in line with the fact that there'd just been another revolution in France in 1848. Realism was basically a way of saying the art world is totally out of touch with everything that is going on socially and politically, and we're sick of it. Um, so yes, this is realism. Um, before I move on from this French academic painting, I just wanted to go on a tangent and say um, that Cabanel's Birth of Venus reminds me of this totally unrelated uh, painting by Rubens, a Flemish artist people might be familiar with. And I just couldn't help but include it because this Rubens painting is insane for the, just the way that the hair is painted. And it really shows you, you know, one painting was painted in 1641, another painting was in 1863, how little art academies were moving, which is why realist painters were so annoyed. Um, even though this style of painting was outdated, you have to appreciate like the technical amazingness of it. Like, honestly, I just, I, I actually took these photos in Vienna to get a really close up picture of how the hair was painted. I've never seen such, um, such well painted hair. It's just, yeah, I couldn't believe it. And I'm not even one, a person who loves this kind of painting, but this really blew me away. And I thought it was another interesting painting to include anyway for um, what we were talking about in the Renaissance class about the juxtaposition of white women and black women as this trend that started happening in the Renaissance. Uh, anyway, so this painting is a tangent, but one of my absolute favorites. So um, back to realism, this Angelus, it's called Millet's Angelus, is probably the third really famous work of, of realist art. Um, it's seen as like a really, a massive um, criticism of the obsession that French academies had with mythology and a turn towards a more pure, religious, homey, field, all of the adjectives, um, style of living. So this is a really famous one to remember if you are someone who likes realism and who wants to look further into it. But I wanted to include these because these are my favorites, like of all the, of all the paintings that fall under the category of the realist movement in Paris. Um, I just love these, floor scrapers um just for the like the way that the the little curls of the floors come up i just really and, and the tools and the knives um and the movement in the painting i really really love this and even this like the walls are so nice like the blue walls the red stripe um i love these i really really love these paintings um so yeah, I don't, I, I know some realist paintings aren't to everyone's taste, but I really love these. Um, I, this, these two paintings are um, a good segue actually to talking about two realist painters who basically straddled the, um, can't think of the words today, can't speak English today, who straddled the divide between realism and impressionism they almost overlap well they do overlap basically realism starts around the 1850s in france in paris and the first impressionist exhibition is in 1874. um so for those of you thinking what are we doing talking about realism in a class about abstract art you'll slowly see that we're getting there um and even though they seem disconnected, they are actually connected because there were many impressionist painters or painters who are deemed to be impressionist like Manet and Caillabot, who also did the floor scrapers, um, who actually uh, straddled both movements, um, even though their paintings look, you know, start looking a bit more impressionistic in their technique. And we'll get to the impressionist technique in a minute. Their subject matter is still very much real life, real people. And um, we talked about Manet's Olympia as well in the Renaissance class, um, how Manet was kind of um, almost taking the mickey of 
these very traditional Renaissance paintings um, by copying an old Titian painting and updating it. So again, this is kind of like a FU to the French Academy. Um, and actually even more interestingly, Manet's Olympia and Cabanel's Birth of Venus were both painted in the, the exact same year, which is absolutely crazy when you look at them, but it just gives you a sense of how radical, um, how radical the realists and the impressionists were for their time. And actually these two paintings were both exhibited at the French Academy of Art. And people went absolutely crazy criticizing Manet's Olympia and saying that the realists were terrible and the impressionists were terrible and the world had gone mad and we should stick to the old style of painting, you can imagine. Um, but yes, Manet is, you know, the perfect example of someone who bridges the gap between realism and impressionism, like I said, because his style of painting is a bit looser. It's not as, um, it starts to move away from this very academic, perfect hair type of painting. It just gets a bit looser. I've just put some of his paintings of Spain here because they're amazing. But we're not gonna do a whole, we're not gonna do a whole class on Manet because Manet brings us into Impressionism. I'm just gonna check no one's had any questions. So far, so good. It is gonna be a class of like, realism, impressionism, abstract, cubism, blah, 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 um, which is a bit overwhelming, but um, it's, it's part of the point in this moment in art history because there's literally an explosion, a total explosion of art movements and artists and it's, it's crazy, the, it's crazy. So if it feels like an overwhelming set of changes moving so quickly, that's because it was literally like that. Realism and Impressionism are basically 10 years apart. Impressionism and Post-Impressionism are 10 years apart, if that, and they all overlap, etc, etc. So bear with me while we do it. Um, so this is what comes up when you Google Impressionism. And um, I, inc oh no, sorry, Impressionism cafes, I was specific about it, because I wanted to show you that um, even though the Impressionists are really famous for their paintings of nature, for their paintings outside, uh, one of the most radical things about the Impressionists is that they painted everyday life. And in that way, they were indebted to the realists who came before them. You know, um, just like the realists, they basically said, we're not painting kings and queens anymore. We're not painting portraits of the aristocracy anymore. We're gonna paint real life. But the way in which they differ to the realists is that the Impressionists painted the bourgeoisie, they painted the middle classes, you know, cafes and drinking, um, all this kind of thing. Lunches on lunch at the boating party, very uh, middle class, which also reflects the new socio-political reality of um, Paris. And another really radical thing about the Impressionists that people don't talk about so much you know people talk about their paintings of nature how radical their style was but one of the most radical things was actually um how they portrayed drinking um everyone especially the women in impressionist paintings are drinking all the time and it was the first time in art that you had so much alcohol and actually there was a massive alcoholism in paris alcohol problem in paris at the time so they were quite, um, they weren't just painting beautiful scenes, they were quite critical of how people lived and how much they drank and especially the representations of women at this time start to get interesting, finally, uh, compared to <laughs> this, this absolute monstrosity of a painting. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I love Impressionism for all those reasons not just because they're really beautiful but it is true that impressionist paintings are really beautiful and this one Monet's impressionism sunrise is like probably the iconic impressionist painting uh it was exhibited at the first impressionist exhibition in 1874 which by the way the impressionists organized 
on their own because the French Academy of Art refused to exhibit their works. So for the first time ever, you had artists organizing their own exhibitions. So this realism and impressionism was basically the death of the art academy. Like some people would say the art academies, like the institutional study of art never recovered. Um, like artists just took control of their own life. Um, so yeah, this is the famous impressionist painting. It doesn't represent any of the real interesting things about impressionism, uh, like the socio-political aspects of it. It just um, shows you their technique, which also was a really important facet of impressionism. You can really see here how much they broke up their brush strokes. Um, which, considering this was painted less than 10 years after Cabanal, let's go back to this, less than 10 years after this is actually mad. Um, and there are interesting reasons why the technique changed so much. And part of it is actually technical because for the first time you could buy paint in tubes, like we take that for granted now, but you didn't have to mix your own paint and you could buy fully stood up easels. Um, so what happened is that artists started painting outside for the first time. They didn't have to make sketches outside and then go into their studio and mix the paint. Impressionists would literally stand outside and finish the painting in the moment, um, which had never happened before. And because of being able to paint outside, impressionists became really obsessed with capturing light and they felt like this kind of um, broken up technique was a more realistic depiction of what it feels like to experience light when you're outside and it's kind of slightly shifting. Um, so for them, they would say this is absolutely a realistic depiction of the sensation of watching light change. And often they would paint the same subject 15 times just in different lights and they would call it cathedral at sunset, cathedral at 10 minutes past sunset, you know, whatever, yeah. cathedral at dawn. Um, so, yeah, so the technique is important. It's just that I find the socio-political aspects more interesting. But, um, but nonetheless, okay, I'm just going to check I haven't missed anything in my notes about Impressionism, because I realise I'm not taking notice of them. Um, invention of tube paints. Um, the experience of light, yes, okay. So um, this is like an absolute whirlwind tour of Impressionism, but like I said, we're moving on to the next thing, which is post-Impressionism. Um, again, overlaps with Impressionism, but tends to be later. The first Impressionist exhibition was in the 70s. Post-Impressionism is more around the 80s, 1880s, 1890s, when Van Gogh starts painting. These are like four iconic, the four post-impressionist painters, if you want to remember any, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Seurat, and Gauguin. And post-impressionism um, differed from impressionism. They have the same kind of technique, but instead of focusing on everyday life, like the Impressionists did, like the middle class, they started turning more inwards, like expressing emotional lives as opposed to the physical reality of the world. Of course, this is a massive generalization. You can find many, um, you can find many exceptions to this rule, but their paintings tend to be they they tend to be much brighter and their colours tend to be actually less realistic. So you can see this shift away from portraying the world in the colors and the shapes that it actually is and starting to portray the world how you want to see it in your head. Um, again, whirlwind tour of post-impressionism. The one post-impressionist that we're gonna to remember today is Cezanne. And that's because even though Van Gogh is more famous, Van Gogh is like, He's, he's just his own thing, his world, his life, his painting. It's like, it needs a whole, it could be a whole class in itself. It's a whole museum in itself. It's a different thing. Cezanne is actually more 
important in terms of like linking one movement to the next and um you'll be able to to see that because here in this painting that you're looking at you can see that he breaks up the colors and the brush strokes to an even more extreme extent than the impressionists like he actually starts to create little boxes that might remind you a bit of cubist paintings which we will get to um and the reason why he painted like this um is kind of like the impressionists because he wanted to capture different viewpoints in one painting so he just layered squares as he moved around the mountain basically um so this is uh this is how uh Cezanne basically took what the impressionists had done and um and moved it forward and yeah, some people are saying actually that looks a bit cubist and you're absolutely right. And this painting that you're looking at, Mont Saint-Victoire, is seen as like one of the most critical paintings in the development of cubism, even though it's post-impressionist. Um, before we get to the cubists though, and this is a good segue, I just want to talk about another group of artists um, who, interpreted impressionism slightly differently the fauvists like i said there's a million different art movements happening at the same time it really was um this busy uh the fauvists if you type in fauv fauvism into google this is what you get um you can see in the images the inspiration that they took from impressionism in terms of the technique but instead of breaking up the image even more like Suzanne had done they um they kind of took the color and the emotional aspect of post-impressionism and exploded it even further like cut all links with reality and and basically made massively colorful paintings and um the word fauvism i have this in my notes actually the word fauvism means wild beast i don't actually know in what language is that that must be french um, and it was originally an insult, like this art critic said, these paintings look like wild beasts, and the Fauvists adopted it as their art movement. And it was actually the same with the Impressionists and the Cubists. Um, one of the critics at the very first Impressionist exhibition in 1874 said, these paintings look like nothing but impressions. And the Impressionists were like, okay, we'll take it. We're now Impressionists, that's absolutely fine. And it was the same with Cubism at the first Cubist exhibition. Uh, one of the critics said, this is nothing but cubes. So you can, you can see how what links all of these movements since realism is actually this massive rejection for institutional art, art critics, art academies, um, which is what makes it such an exciting moment in the history of European art and such an overwhelming moment like we're going to continue moving from movement to movement um before i do move on to the next movement i just have to highlight matisse's dances i have the label somewhere if you can see it oh no i didn't label it um this is like my favorite but this is i really love this painting so um i had to include it and just show some for scale just to show you how big it is I just have to include some of these pictures of um, Matisse painting. I don't know if I had any um, Matisse quotes. No, I don't. Um, yes, but I do have in my notes that critics saw these Fauvist paintings and described them as an orgy of colors. So they absolutely detested them. Um, Matisse's painting is also a segue because Matisse was obsessed with um, dance, obviously, which is why one of his mm. most famous paintings is called The Dance. And he really connected, um, he really connected art to dance in a way that would then carry on in the 20th century. Um, and it was carried on by the Expressionists. Segway. Um, so yeah we are moving on to the next movement one of the earliest expressionists 
of the 20th century of all time, if you want to say, is Kandinsky. And um, even though obviously Kandinsky's paintings are very different to the paintings of Matisse, for example, and other Fauvists and the Impressionists, one of the things that connect Matisse and Kandinsky is this interest in uh, dance and movement. And um, basically what the Expressionists believed and what Kandinsky believed uh, is, and actually this kind of connects all of them, the Fauvists and the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, what they all believed is that art, painting was the most limited art form compared to dance, uh, theater, music, because art was, sorry, because painting was obsessed with being literal and representing real life, whereas other art forms weren't tied to realistic representation in the same way. So what all these abstract art movements thought that they were doing is liberating painting from reality and freeing it, basically. Um, and that's why Kandinsky made all these very interesting paintings of dance, the same with Matisse. That's also why Kandinsky um, argued that painting should aspire to be like music, i.e. painting should aspire to have the same effect on the viewer as music has on a listener. When you're listening to music, you don't need to see, you don't need to understand something literal in order to take meaning from it. You just experience it in an abstract way. And he wanted his paintings to have the same effect. You can't read the message, but you can interpret it in the same way that you would listen to music. Um, he actually writes about it. And had I planned ahead or not jumped into American abstract expressionism, um, maybe I would have actually put that as the, the reading, a Kandinsky text, um, which I can link. So just to like say a bit about Kandinsky, I'm gonna read from my notes now. He was born in Moscow in 1866. He decided to study economics and law, but then after seeing one of Monet's series of paintings, Monet who we mentioned here, after seeing one of Monet's paintings um, about light, he was faced with a dilemma to be either a professor or begin a career as an artist. And he decided to learn painting. And that's why he moved to Germany, to Munich in 1896. So this also gives you a sense of how all of these different movements are happening at the same time and influencing new artists at the same time. So it's, it's as fast as we're going in this class, to be honest. Um, okay, so Kandinsky moves to Munich. Um, Kandinsky moves to Munich, yes. And he forms a group of artists called the Blue Rider Group. And the Blue Rider Group are seen as the first expressionist group of artists. Expressionism would come up time and time again in the 20th century. Like you've got German Expressionism, which was a bit later, kind of post-World War I, these very anguished expressive paintings that kind of make sense after the destruction of the war. You've got abstract Expressionism, Expressionism again in America, where you've got like Jackson Pollock. But the Blue Rider group are seen as the, the first in the 20th century. Um, I also included this image here, and a link to this article if you click on it when I send the slides, uh, to show that when Kandinsky trained as a painter, um, most of his early paintings were in the Impressionist style and then post-Impressionist style. So um, again, it just shows you how these movements were connected. So um, the Blue Rider group was made up of a lot of Russian artists as well as German artists, uh, founded in 1913, just to give you a sense of the time where we're at. And the other thing going on alongside the Blue Rider group is actually the Ballet Russe. 
And these two things were happening at the same time, obviously because lots of Russian dancers were coming to Paris, lots of Russian artists were coming to Europe, like Kandinsky. Um, people like Kandinsky were designing theatre sets for the ballet. So um, the other thing that happens around 1910, after you've had Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and Fauvism, is that the ballet starts to massively influence art, which is what people like Matisse wanted all along when they were painting things like this. So um, the art of the Ballet Russe, to be honest, has its own specific history. And you can see that it's not necessarily abstract, like this image on the left is a design for the Ballet Russe. Um, it's not necessarily abstract, like they still had figures, but I've put it next to this Blue Rider poster and also Matisse's dancers to just show you um, how influenced the Ballet Russe was by um, developments in abstract art. And actually some of the most famous um, expressionist artists who were also painting abstractly, um, like Paul Klee, designed um, theatre sets for the Ballet Russe. Paul Klee, I couldn't find an image of this, but he's the one who did that painting that's literally circles around, like, I think it's like eight circles in different colors. Um, that is a very famous print that lots of people um, tend to have. And um, the thing is like, when, when, like some of the really great comments that I had this week about abstract art were asking, you know, how can you just have a circle, you know, a load of circles and call it art? Like what is, you know, what is that trying to say? And it's not necessarily trying to say anything, but when you put it in the context of this explosion of color, change, abstraction, the rejection of academic painting, it's, at the time, it was just so, radical and it was really saying something that we take for granted now which is that art doesn't have to represent reality art can express your own inner life or express nothing at all which was really radical um so yes um the the ballet russe even though it it's not you know it's a ballet movement it's not a movement of abstract painting massively influenced abstract art because um, many of the most famous expressionist painters, post-impressionist painters, bogus painters, who were, you know, making abstract things, designed stage sets for the Ballet Russe. And um, this one that you're seeing here is by Natalia Goncharova, who is an absolutely pioneering woman in this, you know, mesh of men, 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 men making abstract art. And she was Russian. She came over with Kandinsky. She was very good friends with him. To be honest, they were all friends. They all knew each other. Um, and some of her stage sets are like the most beautiful um, that you'll ever see. And she also did paintings. And in fact, one of you also sent me an image of an artwork that you'd seen in the Guggenheim and you didn't know the name of the artist, but you knew it was a woman artist uh, painting in the early 20th century in the abstract style. Um, and I think it might have been Natalia Goncharova. So, yeah. Um, ah, yes. I couldn't help but include this. I couldn't help but include this. Um, what did I want to say? Let me look at my notes. Post-impressionist. Okay, okay, okay. I wanted to say um, Gauguin is a post-impressionist who we looked at, let me go all the way back. Here, this is another Gauguin painting. He was one of the post-impressionists. And his use of color uh, is probably the best example of how post-impressionism influenced Fauvism and the Ballet Russe and Expressionism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you put his paintings next to things by the Ballet Russe, um, you get a sense of how these artists were taking inspiration. 
also because um, Gauguin did lots of Orientalist paintings and lots of the Ballet Russe was very Oriental. Like, if anyone is a fan of ballet, I'm sure they'll know lots of ballets set in China at this time or North Africa. Um, it was really a style that both ballet and art were engaging with. Um, to be honest, this Gauguin tangent, I only wanted to include <laughs> because um, A, I wanted to show you that post-impressionism, fauvism, all of these movements were still, uh, were still orientalizing their subjects. Um, we've done a session on orientalist painting before, um, and it, it was still, uh, yeah, it was still influencing artists. Um, they were still painting things and orientalizing things and everything. Um, I wanted to include as well this series by Kahinde Wiley because I just thought at this point the Kahinde Wiley references are like a joke in this class how many times I managed to bring him up but Kahinde Wiley did a contemporary take on Gauguin's paintings of Tahiti which were these very famous series of post-impressionist paintings um, and he went to Tahiti and actually asked people uh, on the island how they wanted to be represented and he wanted to do this very collaborative work that would kind of refute the um, voyeuristic orientalist representations that are so often found in the ballet russe in orientalist painting in fauvist painting in mm -hmm. post-impressionist painting like Gauguin. So these are some of the works that Kahinde Wiley produced um, and you can see how much they're indebted to the early 20th century and the post-impressionist movement and the colours of the Fovis, um, and the kind of swirling shapes of the expressionists. Yeah, just to, to show you that it lives on. But um, that, to be honest, is kind of the end of what I would call Impressionism, post-impressionism, fauvism, the ballet russe. And it's this kind of string of painting in the early 20th century that was so colorful and so expressive and emotional and extremely beautiful. Um, but it's definitely not the only direction that 20th century art went in. I would say that there was another string of artists who interpreted the legacy of Impressionism very different, very differently, and that was the Cubists. Um, the Cubists took Cezanne in a totally different way. They didn't admire the colours or the emotional aspect of it or the movement. They admired the way that, um, did I say Gauguin? They admired the way that Cezanne had actually broken up the different parts of the painting, like the way that he was challenging actual sight, like how people viewed the world. Um, and so that leads to cubism. No, no, come in, come in. Sorry, my housemate just got back. Um, okay, so I've put here side by side the Cezanne painting, um, a cubist painting by Picasso, and then a later painting by Picasso, so that you can, um, get a sense of like this transition. Um, like I said, you can see from here, from this painting, that color was definitely not what interested the cubists at all in any way, shape or form. Most of their like paintings are very muted, um, not necessarily emotionally expressive. Um, instead, what cubists wanted to do it's a very different challenge that they made. They, they didn't want to reject the kind of cold academicism of traditional painting. They wanted to actually go back to the crisis in art that happened in the Renaissance when people discovered perspective and this whole new way of planning and looking at the world and creating depth in paintings. They actually wanted to go even further back and challenge that and say, we actually don't know how to represent reality. We all decided that this perspective is how to paint, 
and that things need to look very rounded and that that's the best representation of how we see the world. Um, but there are other ways to look at the world and they wanted to do what Suzanne did, which is to represent something from multiple different angles and create three dimensionality like that instead of just using perspective. And they actually thought it would provide like a more realistic um, representation of how we experience three dimensional reality. Um, and you can see how that is also indebted to the impressionists who were trying to represent light in a different way. Um, so yeah, obviously the Cubists just um, interpreted the legacy of Impressionism very differently. Um, and it's not to say that there weren't any artists who straddled post-Impressionism and Cubism, Fauvism and Cubism. Of course, they were all interconnected, um, but the, what's the word, like the, desires of cubism the goals of the movement were very different to something like fauvism um which is why i've put it in this kind of separate stream um i wanted to show you because we talked about marcel duchamp last week two weeks ago when we did the conceptual art class that uh duchamp the last painting that he painted because if you remember i said that he made a statement in 1913 saying, I'm never gonna paint again, was a Cubist painting. So he was in this circle as well. And when you look, you know, when you scroll through all this stuff and realize, you know, everything that was going on with painting, you can kind of see why Marcel Duchamp just thought, enough, I'm not painting again. Um, I'm sick of these debates about how we represent reality on a flat screen of painting and how we express the world, blah, blah, blah. And he just wanted to parody this obsession with painting by saying, look, anything can be art and you're all being ridiculous. So in this context, his work of art makes a bit more sense. Um, Okay, I'm just going back to my notes to see if I've missed anything about cubism. No, nothing, um, nothing. So all I wrote in my notes is that artists at this point had become totally independent from the academy, which you can imagine. Uh, next movement, we're almost there, <laughs> we're almost there. Uh, cubism, massively inspired futurism. I'm not going to go into futurism because it's a class in its own right. Um, everything that we've been talking about so far has basically been happening in Paris. Impressionism and post-impressionism, the Ballet Russe, you've got a few things being triggered in Germany, like, you know, Kandinsky going to Munich and the Expressionists. Um, and now finally, futurism is actually based in Italy and happens in Italy. Um, and you can see very clearly how futurism was influenced by cubism. Um, and, but there are big differences between them, not least because one is happening in Paris and the other one is happening mainly in Italy, but also because what distinguishes um, futurism is that they weren't just interested in changing how we represent three-dimensionality they were actually obsessed with the future like quite literally they thought that modern technology is something that needed to be celebrated in painting that painting needed to become as dynamic as all of the fast industrial changes that were happening cars planes this massive explosion of technology they wanted painting to keep up with that so Futurism, even though it looks like cubism, had, yeah, its very own goals. And then probably the main, main difference between futurism and cubism is that futurism, because it happened in Italy, um, became massively connected with the rise of fascism. And another text that I would have put as a reading, had I known that we were gonna cover this older history of abstract painting, is Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto. 
he wrote this manifesto of painting basically saying that painting needed to turn itself towards the future and be more dynamic and Marinetti who wrote this ended up being a massive supporter of Mussolini and futurism got wrapped up in all of these really um, nasty, nasty politics. So I, I love political art movements and would do a whole class on this. It's definitely not my speciality. Um, so yeah, you can't really cover futurism quickly, but I just wanted to mention it for those of you because you seem to be quite interested in like the political stuff. This is a movement that you might really love. Um, but that's where I'm going to leave it with futurism. And I think we're now at the last ism, the last movement that happens before 19, before the start of World War One, even. So in just like 30 years, so much has happened, but we're almost there. Um, and the last movement that we're going to talk about is something called suprematism. Um, and it was started by a Russian artist called Malevich. And he made this very, very, very famous painting called Black Square. And I just really wanted to include this because um, there were so many comments when we talked about conceptual art about how another thing in art that confuses people or makes people think, oh, this is absolutely ridiculous, is exactly this type of painting where you just have a square, like a canvas, and it's just, it's just there. Um, and Malevich did the very first of all of these that have happened in the 20th and 21st century now. He, he was the very first. So um, when you're talking about art, something like conceptual art, you would probably look back to um, Duchamp and the urinal from 1915, but as, as kind of the most influential crazy moment of the 20th century, but some other people who prefer painting would probably look back to Malevich and tell you, no, 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 the black square from 1917 is the moment in the, like the moment in the 20th century that changed art. So you get people on two different sides of the spectrum. So I wanted to show you, and it's interesting because the black square and the fountain, which I included here, both uh, happened in the same year, which is crazy. Um, Malevich, unlike Marcel Duchamp, he wasn't doing this to parody painting. He wasn't trying to be funny like Duchamp was. Um, he was actually so convinced by everything that had happened with the increasingly abstract nature of painting from Impressionism to Cubism to Futurism that he wanted to take it to the extreme. And that's what he wanted futurism to do. He wanted it to be like the purest type of abstract painting, the culmination of what all of these different movements had been trying to do, which is to liberate painting from reality. Um, and I just wanted to read you what Malevich wrote um, in this text, which I've linked here called From Cubism to Futurism to Suprematism. Um, before I give you a quote from that text, it's just interesting to note that sometimes when you do a class like this that has so many isms, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and blah, 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 it's, it's easy to kind of think that art historians must be kind of making it up, like looking back and saying, okay, how can we best divide these movements into like chunks and blah, blah, blah. And it is true that sometimes um, art historians do that. Like they just label something that was never called Baroque at the time or whatever. But in the 20th century, well, from the 1815 onwards, it's just crazy because artists start being so self-conscious about their labels. And they are actually making these isms. So you can see here that in 1915, Malevich actually wrote a text called From Cubism to Futurism to Suprematism. So this is how artists wanted their history to be taught. Like they were witnessing themselves in real time, this, this change in art. 
And um, that's still how we're teaching it today. So it was very self-conscious. And if you're wondering how the hell did all of these things influence each other at the same time, Malevich is in Russia, Kandinsky's moving to Germany, he's working with the ballet Russe in Paris, Futurism's happening in Italy, Cubism's happening, happening in Paris, it's crazy. It's actually because artists were not just painting, but also writing their own manifestos, like the Futurist Manifesto, like this text we're about to read by Malevich, um, and they were publishing their texts in art magazines. And these magazines were traveling, they were being printed, you finally had color reproduction. It was just such a like creative explosion. And lots of art historians now are starting to study, instead of just the paintings, the actual art magazines and starting to look more at visual culture, um, which is really like, ahead of the game um, because those magazines are like works of art in and of themselves and they they explain a bit how this how this all um, happened and the art magazines were amazing because they typically combined poetry literature collage painting and all these things in one document and when you see how creative and inspiring they were you understand why so many artists were jumping on this bandwagon and saying oh i'm going to do this i'm going to do this i'm going to take it further anyway um um so malevich i'm going to read you now uh part of his text that we're looking at he says um what does he say okay he says Art requires truth, not sincerity. Objects must vanish like smoke to, to attain a new artistic culture. Um, art advances towards creation as an end in and of itself and towards the domination over the forms of nature. So basically Malevich's text and Malevich's black square shows that artists thought that they were actually you know by using abstract shapes and becoming increasingly abstract they thought that they were liberating painting from reality and they thought that it would they thought that it would survive for longer like dominating nature you have to remember also that photography had been invented at this point um in 1869 or 39 was the first camera, 69, blah, blah, blah. By the 20th century, cameras are fully functioning. And painters had to do something different. Um, they were sick of like being tied to the representation of, of reality, basically. Um, and they thought that art, like painting, could offer something else, like had the potential to offer something else. Um, so, the black square looks really stupid, but Malevich actually thought that this was a philosophical turning point. Um, and, you know, lots of people sh frown, like not frown, um, laugh and kind of say, oh, art for art's sake, you know, what's the point in art for art's sake? And these painters were actually saying art for art's sake is exactly the point. Painting should just be painting and nothing else. It shouldn't be trying to be a photograph. It shouldn't be trying to make a political point. It should be turning inwards and just giving people a blank canvas onto which they can project whatever emotional expression they want. And that's what the black square is about. Um, I don't know if that's entirely made sense, but we can talk about it now. Um, in questions, I started 10 minutes late or seven minutes late, so I'm, there's plenty of time for questions now. Um, I have purposefully stopped just before World War I, uh, because in the next class, we have to do two classes on abstract art, it became very clear to me in the last two weeks. In the next class, we're going to talk about what happened to abstract painting in in this period between the wars. And you'll see in those classes that so many artists became refugees who fled to New York um, between 1917 and 1945. And it's no coincidence that then 
Jackson Pollock is making his first abstract paintings, American abstract paintings, in 1943. So hopefully when we get to that point in two weeks time when we do our next class, it will make more sense now that we have all of this um, background information. And it's crazy that we started with realism. Um, just as a discussion point, as people ask questions, I just wanted to put a Mondrian painting on because somebody sent me some Mondrian paintings that they really liked. Um, Mondrian perfectly suits this time period. He was working in Amsterdam, but I suppose he represents like you know, Italian artists interpreted it this way, German artists interpreted it this way, Amsterdam artists interpreted abstract expressionism in this way, uh, not abstract expressionism, abstract painting, i.e. cubism, fauvism, this is how they, um, this is how they took it. So Mondrian was painting, I mean, he fits this time period between 1910 and 1920. And I just wanted to say, um, a, that Mondrian fits this time scale that we've been looking at because his early paintings were Impressionist and Post-Impressionist and then Cubist. And then he arrived at this very pure, this very pure thing. And he actually, uh, I mean, I said I would finish the class now, but I am going to give one more quote. He said in 1914, art is higher than reality and has no direct relation to reality. To approach the spiritual in art, one will make as little use as possible of reality, because reality is opposed to the spiritual. In this way, we find ourselves in the presence of an abstract art. Art should be above reality, otherwise it has no value for man. So you can see how similar that is to Malevich's Black Square. But the point I wanted to make to start a discussion, if I ever start a discussion, is that even though Mondrian fits into this whole discussion we're having about the development of abstract art, people tend to like Mondrian much more than some of the other pure abstract artists that you'll see in this picture, for example. And I'm the same, I absolutely love Mondrian and, and I don't know what, what, it is, um, what it is about him that makes people not look at that and say, oh, my five-year-old could have done it. Um, so, yeah, if anyone wants to tell me what, why they like it, maybe, um, maybe enlighten me. Whew, that was a lot of stuff. I just need to actually have a sip of water. 